I want to welcome everybody to Civility Speaks with Robert Sachs. This is podcast number nine. It's been a few weeks since I did any presentation. We did our uh, live book signing a couple weeks ago because the book was launched. And if you've had a chance to get the book either through me or through Amazon or through John Hunt Publishing, I want to thank you for getting it. And also, I, if there's any questions, I like to be able to um, help people out in terms of interpreting sometimes what I say, if it seems at all difficult or confusing, um, or comments or other things you'd like me to consider for the future. Um, in terms of a podcast, I certainly want it to be that, uh, as well as sometimes having some guests, that if you email me uh, or you contact me in one way or the other, that I will be able to actually um, maybe address some of those issues that come up that are actually probably mentioned in uh, my book, The Path to Civility, but at the same time, it allows me to dig through it and find those kinds of things that are most useful for whatever topic you have in mind with respect to how do we develop more civility and respect in um, our individual lives as well as our collective lives. So, I had said a little while back that I was going to have my next podcast focus on civil disobedience. We had gone through the four levels of compassion and the forms of civility attached with each one, the peaceful form of civility, the more um, empowering or educational form of civility, the form of civility that has the weighing up and the more rational look at pros and cons, which has more to do with making a decision uh, of being able to change positions, and then a wrathful form of civility where actually there's a need to essentially step in in a way that is a little bit more forceful and more direct when things seem to be going in a direction that isn't helpful for the greatest number of people or for the situation. Before I get into the idea of civil disobedience, though, I need to talk about the concept of reification. Now, that might seem like it's a, uh, uh, a strange thing to talk about, but actually, in terms of civility, it's very, very important. So what is reification? Reification uh, is closely connected also to deification, where we uh, take something and we make it, we elevate it. A reification will, uh, in the say, case of social or political or cultural interaction, has to do with those things which the greatest number of people seem to agree is the best way to do stuff. And so what happens is a way of doing it, uh, the attitudes around it, uh, become sort of codified. In which case, what happens is we have a, a policy or a, uh, a moral or a, uh, a certain kind of concept that most people seem to be in agreement with. And this happens um, pretty easily. What happens is that over time, what goes on is we're interacting and we are really just fumbling to ecstasy. We are fumbling through trying to figure out what works and what doesn't as life keeps on changing. And then at some point what happens, people go, yeah, that's the best way to do this. It's the best way to do this. And we want to do that all the time. And these are the reasons why we're going to do it. And so suddenly something which is basically meets the time suddenly begins to take on a life of its own. It becomes reified. It becomes the idea for this particular this or that. So we all have those in our societies, okay? We have things that we do. And what I would say is, at this point, um, these things are certainly being tested. And let me explain how this happens. 
initially what goes on is when we're doing stuff and we finally decide that this is the best way to do it for the most number of people and there's kind of an agreement of that, there's kind of a uh, initial buy-in that people do to a greater or lesser degree, but there's kind of an allegiance or an alignment which also is in keeping with the idea of being an ally to what's going on. We sort of like go along with it. It seems to make sense. It works for the greatest number of people. And so we really think that in order for there to be a civility, for there to be an absence of discord, we do things that way. But there is the idea in Zen that if you try and squeeze a bar of soap too tight, it will slip out of your hands. Or when you try and grab onto sand, like the sands of time, what happens is things keep on changing. Things keep on morphing. Things come up that were not expected. You think about what's going on right now in terms of COVID-19. You think about people's lives uh, where they're in a... Uh, People were used to where hurricanes used to go, and now hurricanes are going to places they know they don't go. Okay, there was Tornado Alley, but suddenly tornadoes are appearing more places. There are fires in certain areas, but fires are growing to places where people are not used to fires. So what happens is that which we have gotten used to begins to be challenged, and what we have allegiance to becomes more and more difficult over time. Now, if we have nothing dramatic that goes on, when things are just kind of bibbity bobbing along through time, um, and things are changing and those reified ideas are beginning to wilt around the edges, we have compliance. We sort of are more passive about it. It's kind of okay. Is it really convenient for us to do it? Yeah, more than not, we'll go along with it. So we have compliance, but compliance is definitely short of allegiance. It gets short of allegiance, becomes more passive. But then over time, things keep on changing. And suddenly compliance seems more inconvenient uh, what we believe in or what we think about becomes more out of step with what is actually going on. And then what happens usually in situations like that, there are people that don't want it to change. Even though change is staring them in the face, they don't want things to change. Why? Oftentimes, they're making good money on the situation. Their families seem more stable in this situation. Their status in society is not being threatened. Where they are in their lives, in their positions, seem to work. And so the circumstances are changing and people become more and more uncomfortable with what goes on. And then there creates to be, there gets to be more and more dissatisfaction over time. Now, in terms of social or political situations, one of the things that usually happens in order for people to keep things the way they are or the way they have been, that reified idea, what they do is they bureaucratize. They set up rules and regulations and policies, and we over-bureaucratize things, and we make things sort of complicated for people to uh, make changes. And what we do is we develop, interestingly enough, we develop situations, for example, in government, where rather than looking at one policy and trying to make a change, what we do is we look at 20 policies all, all at once. And therefore, although there's some area that needs to be changed, suddenly there's so many other considerations that have nothing to do with the issue. But suddenly people have to decide about those things if they're going to decide about this. That's what happens, by the way, in terms of our American government. It makes no sense. You want to necessarily um, stop 
there from being too much in the way of, let's say, oil drilling off the coast of Alaska or whatever it is. But in Congress, in terms of legislation, they will put little riders, little things in the legislation, which will say, well, you also have to agree that you're going to lessen the restriction on the killing of baby seals. Now, you love baby seals. You don't want to lessen the restrictions on baby seals. But in order for you to get people to vote for you or vote with you on the issue you're concerned about, they've got to agree to lessen the restriction on killing baby seals, which later on down the road, if you're a politician, will come to haunt you. Okay? So what we do is we bureaucratize, we make rules, we make regulations, we blend things together that don't make much sense when they're blended together. We look at deflecting the ideas, deflecting to a different issue, whatever it is. We try to create other shiny objects to pay attention to so we don't pay attention to what's needed. So we bureaucratize. That's one of the things we have. And then what happens is more than likelihood, likely, we go from uh, allegiance to compliance to expecting some level of obedience, okay? And I want to describe, I'm going to read the description because there's three different forms of obedience that I want to describe. And this is from my book, The Path of Civility. Obedience involves the following of rules, laws, someone or something because they are expected to be followed by those creating the rules, the laws, the pecking order or such, sometimes by those who think they should or feel compelled to do so, or both. In this respect, there are three levels of obedience. First and foremost, where there is the greatest power disparity is that of submission, where following the rule, the law, the ideology, the lord of the manor, is not only expected, but there are prescribed consequences for not doing so. Then there is an obedience where the rational or justification for following such or being under the banner of an ideology or leader is that one sees merit or something of value in obedience to such. In this, there is a subtle line between sometimes a combination of submission with a willful abdication of personal responsibility. Although this may create social harmony and general sense of pacifying type of civility, whenever there is a power differential or a deference based on social or cultural norms, things do change. Furthermore, rarely do those whose power or mandates, which have been legitimated by fitting the times, give up their advantage when change is needed for the general good. Thus, abdication of personal responsibility can slide into unwilling submission. Finally, there is obedience that comes from a mutual or on the level understanding. Thus, like the paramita or perfection of discipline, there is actual joy and benefit that comes from adherence, from adherence to such. So these are the different levels of obedience that can arise. And so what we see is the first bureaucratization and then the encouragement for obedience, for allegiance, for loyalty. Okay various things that people are supposed to be then committed to in that way. And if you have a rational thinking mind and you're paying attention to what is around you, more than likely you become aware that something is going on that needs to be changed or change is afoot. And what I always say is we all know what's going on. We just agree not to blow each other's cover, which means in this situation, what's going on is sometimes we will turn a blind eye. 
Sometimes what we will do is we will be more emphatic about holding on to things. And then what we do in doing that, when we have those people around us who decide that they need to say something about this, okay, we marginalize those people. Now, in religious circles, what that is, is the creation of heretics, okay? You can think of Jesus really being a heretic, okay? You can think of the Buddha being a heretic. Jesus paid the ultimate price. The Buddha managed to not necessarily escape that fate, but during the time when he was teaching the Dharma, his teaching, the way he saw things as being, what happened was that there was a really strong backlash from the Brahminic community, from the Hindu community. And what happened was many, many people that were following the Buddha became ostracized and hunted down. Strangely enough, some of you may have heard of this particular gentle, gentleman, and some of you may think of him being a strange person for me ref to refer to in these current days when certain people are being vilified for whatever their affiliations were over 100 or 150 years ago. There was a man by the name of Albert Pike. Okay, you look up Albert Pike, you're going to find that he was a Confederate general, but he was also a genius, a brilliant man who was also part of his time. So be it. Pike was a great studier of history, and he actually saw, and he said that actually Buddha was probably the first Masonic judge, and that what happened when the Hindu community saw what the Buddha was talking about, which was a breakdown of the caste system, seeing that everybody had awakening potential, and they were being chased. Apparently, some of them moved to Ireland, and the round towers of Ireland are attributed to the disciples of the Buddha, something I did not know, but there you go, one of those, and now you know the rest of the story, okay? For so some of you who remember Paul Harvey. But along with religious people, you have the civil and social spheres. You have people that are considered misfits, radicals, even terrorists. So, for example, in the case of George Washington, George Washington was considered by the Crown of England a terrorist. We do not see him as a terrorist, but to those who are supposed to be swearing a loyalty to the Crown and paying their taxes like good citizens of the colonies, George Washington was causing problems. Benjamin Franklin was causing problems. All those who became the founding mothers and fathers oftentimes paid very, very heavy prices for their understanding that things needed to change. So what does this mean in terms of the concept of civil disobedience, more than likely, from the standpoint of those looking at you, marginalizing you, defining you as a heretic, a radical, a misfit, a terrorist, or whatever they want to name in order for them to see you as being different from, see you as being not committed to your country, or whatever it is they decide is some way, and you're seeing it a different way, okay? None of those people that you are interacting with are going to see anything of what you do as being civil, okay? So what you need to realize in terms of civility from the standpoint of the side you are challenging with respect to how you see things needing to become or you see things changing to be, you will not be seen as being civil. That is the fact. 
So, what you have to do is decide what it means for you to be civil. You've got to decide that inside yourself. That is the perspective you need to be aware of. And so, questions like, what are your intentions for challenging the situation? What are your intentions for wanting to see change? Is the change you are wanting for the goodness of all concerned? If you look at my book in uh, The Path of Civility, in that I talk about uh, like a statement of a friend of mine, this uh, uh, spiritual cosmologist by the name of Jeffrey Bullington, who I love dearly. And he always says he starts everything he does when interacting with the world for the goodness of all concerned. Focusing on that. So you need to pay attention. You need to think of what I describe as the five steps of wise action. Can you step back? Can you judge a situation clearly? Can you see your part in it? Can you engage people from a sense of being on the level? And from those perspectives, can you then help people to move in a good direction for the goodness of all concerned. Now, what can that look like? Okay? There are all sorts of ways in which civility can manifest in that way. When someone stood in front, that Chinese person stood in front of a tank in Tiananmen Square, that was an act of civil disobedience. When you think of people laying down in front of a road or locking arms to block people from stepping into situations and wanting to make a point for people to understand that something needs to change. I'm not saying that's what you do, okay? You don't necessarily lock arms on a freeway necessarily. It doesn't necessarily mean that that is a bad thing to do. But you have to be strategic. How many steps of wise action did you take to understand what was going to yield the result that you want? This takes time because so often in the process of civil disobedience, there is a heartfelt connection. There's a heartfelt connection to, to the need for change. We feel that in our hearts. And so there is a, a process of there being a passionate connection to the change we seek. But one of the things I think is very important from the standpoint, and this is why I think we also look at George Washington and the rules of civility. And one of the things that described in Freemasonry is the idea of circumscribing one's desires and keeping them within due bounds. Now, that doesn't mean that we're always staying within the circle. But what we need to do is ask ourselves some very, very important questions. When we step into wrathful action, when we step into civil disobedience, how can we do that with the greatest amount of mindfulness to create the change we seek knowing full well that there may be disruption, there may be chaos. Can we also, in that situation, not double down on wanting it to be a certain way? That's very important in terms of civil disobedience. Can we go for change and then find where others meet us and then begin more dialogue. Oftentimes, what's very fascinating, I mentioned this in my book, Becoming Buddha, which was originally called The Buddha at War, that what has to happen is we have what we want to see, other people have a different perspective, and we lean forward. 
But when we lean forward, we don't want to double down or press someone else down. How do we meet them? Because the reality is that if we press too hard, more than likely the action that we seek will be retaliated against us in the future. That's one of the things that can happen. We need to realize, and sometimes that is unavoidable, but what we need to understand is, can we, in the heart of us being committed to a change, be open to understand that sometimes a hybrid of that change we seek is actually more powerful, more doable, and can become the idea that wins the day. So, I hope I've created some interesting things to ponder when you look at the idea of civil disobedience. And what we'll do is we're going to pursue other little aspects of the path of civility. What I will be doing probably from this point on, as we've been doing a lot of looking at the teachings of the Buddha, we'll start looking at some of the various um, rules that George Washington followed and see how they apply today to make it so that the civility, the decorum, the propriety that was espoused in these rules can be applied and make them work in today's world. So thank you all for listening and be well.